All right, this is Micro One for the um, 17th uh, today, and uh, the lecture for the 17th today. And today uh, we'll cover a couple of things. One, I, I will talk about the lab for tomorrow. Um, it's, the, it's our last assembly language laboratory, and after this we're going to be programming in C. So this is your um, last chance to really play with assembly language. Well, you can, you can do it anytime you want. Um, but uh, this is the last time you're going to be required to do it for purposes of the course. Now, um, let me just say a, a couple of things. One, um, so I, a lot of people are, seem to be doing okay, and I'm really pleased. I know there's some of you who have not even put your boards together yet, and I'm a little worried about that. Uh, there may be even some that still don't have any of their hardware or parts. And that's just, uh, I mean, that, this is bad. We're deeply into the semester already. We're, uh, we're, we're ready. We're basically uh, getting ready to finish up week four. We'll be in week five of 15 weeks, so one-third done. So it's really important uh, if you're kind of lagging behind to just make a, a really significant effort to get caught up. Really need to do that. Um, okay. Okay. Um, what else? Uh, so I, um, so there's plenty of help for you in the lab. Uh, we have the real privilege of having um, uh, Alex Ibarra, who's our TA, and he is very responsible, uh, and uh, he is really putting in the time to help students. So if you, you know, if if you live in San Antonio, even if you don't, you probably should probably should try and drag your carcass in and get help unless you're just whizzing through these labs. It's not super difficult, uh, and I know there are students that can do it without having to come in. But, uh, but if you're having trouble, please take advantage of the, of the help that's here. I will try and run a help session. Um, I usually try and do one late Friday afternoon, and I, I will try and do that again tomorrow. I'll try and do a little help session, uh, maybe about... Uh, uh, maybe about four o'clock uh, Friday afternoon. Um, so I'll send out that email link uh, 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 tonight. Okay. Um, what else? Let's look at the. Let's shrink this down, and we'll look at the data sheet. Um, so I'm going to shrink in even more. And then I'm going to move myself over here a little bit. And then we will pull up the data sheet. Uh, sorry, the syllabus. And the, the syllabus, um, so here we are on the 17th, and we're going to continue to review the programming test, but I'm also going to talk about the lab. Um, and <clears throat> so, yeah, that's all good. Okay, so, um, so that's what we're going to do. Notice that the programming test is down here on the 29th, so you still got a little bit of time to get caught up, but not a lot. So we're lab three. Tomorrow, lab four next week, and we're gonna we're gonna do the. Uh, um, so I don't know if we'll do if we'll. I think we're. Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, I need to correct this. We we are gonna do we we will do lab the real lab four. I I skipped it last semester. I was glad I did because otherwise we we would we would have been a week further behind when spring break came, and that was the end of the semester basically. Um, so we so we we're not going to skip it this time because I, I found out it really did help students uh, uh, it helps students to do that simpler uh, laboratory in C to begin with so that's what that's what we're going to do this time and I I need to fix this so uh, so yeah we will do lab four the real lab four next week and so let me pull up the data sheet because I want to make sure that that's correct so lab four yeah mm -hmm. so this should be it and lab five then is uh. Yeah, so that, I believe that is right. And this is Blink Series and C. Uh, okay, yeah, so this is it. Okay, uh, this is good. And uh, so we'll go through that uh, when we get there. All right, so I think that's good. Now, um, <clears throat> so let me just talk about the lab at, at first. So here is the... Um, so here's the here's the uh, the lab sheet. Okay, this is uh, this is 
lab three, blink with interrupts. This will be done in assembly language. We're going to use our, our, our Viva board with the 1829 on it. We'll use the SNAP programmer. We'll, you can use a 9-volt battery, or you, you can power it with your uh, 21, uh, uh, the, uh, the 2102 dongle if you want. Um, we will use the onboard um, uh, RGB LED, and we're going to use two of the cobblers. We're going to use the colors connected to pins RA5 and RA2. Um, one of them is green and one of them is blue. The RA5 is uh, green and the RA2 is blue. And we're going to blink the RA5 with the interrupt routine, the ISR. That stands for Interrupt Service Routine. Uh, so we're going to use we're going to use that. Um, uh, we're going to use the green light with that. And the mainline routine is going to blink the blue one. So you're going to have to change the mainline routine so it doesn't blink the green one anymore. And you're going to switch it to blinking the blue one. Uh, and we're going to write a new ISR. And there's a couple of a couple of features. First of all, uh, the ISR has to be located at the interrupt vector, which is 4. And you have to do a little more setup because this time you have to enable the interrupt when timer 0 overflows. And the way you do that is you turn on the timer 0 interrupt enable bit. Before you do that, though, you should clear the flag so you don't generate an interrupt immediately. And um, you also have to configure the timer so it's, uh, so it's turned on and running. Um, when, when the interrupt occurs, the main routine will be, uh, will be interrupted. All the, all the information is going to be saved in the shadow registers and, pushed onto the, and the return address pushed onto the stack from the program counter. And then control will be transferred to location 4. And at location 4, we're going to write a little interrupt service routine. Now, uh, this talks about it. It talks about your hardware setup, which is pretty straightforward. Um, and, and this talks about how we, uh, how we have to uh, uh, clear the flag in the interrupt control register for timer 0, which we already did. We've already done that. Um, if we look at the if we look at the data sheet, I, I we'll just go back and look at timer zero again. If we look at the data sheet, oh actually it's right here. My bad. Uh, if we look at the data sheet for timer zero, let's see uh, timer zero. And actually it's better to go to the end and go up, and then we'll look at the uh, the int common register. So here's the interrupt control register. Now remember, uh, almost all the other modules. Uh, have their uh, their have dedicated control registers specific for those modules, but because the timer zero is one of the legacy parts, uh, some of the older chips uh, didn't have that many registers, and so some of the features were combined in different registers. And so this interrupt control register does have a number of features, and and the control the so the timer zero interrupt enable bit, and the timer zero interrupt flag are in this register, even though it also has some other things uh, like the interrupt on change flag, the interrupt flag. These these two are flags associated with just standard GPIO pins that can trigger interrupts. Just like the timer zero, when it over overflows and sets its flag, if this bit is enabled and if the GIE bit's enabled, will cause an interrupt. In very much the same way, the interrupt on change, uh, well, the interrupt pin, which is a single pin, or the interrupt on change flag, uh, which is uh, um, a, a bunch of pins, uh, can trigger this. Those, any one of those pins that's set up to trigger it, when, when it triggers this flag, that will tr trigger an interrupt as well. And these interrupts are controlled um, through, through the interrupt on change interrupt enable bit, and the interrupt on change flag comes up, but then to check and see which pin is enabled and whether it's a rising edge or falling edge, all those things you can you can go do. And we'll we'll talk about the interrupt on change pins in a bit. These were added in because we didn't really have we only had one pin that could cause interrupts in the legacy in the legacy chips. But in the in the new mid level chips, they wanted more opportunities for interrupts from peripheral pins, and so that's what they did. This bit, the GIE, that controls all interrupts. And if that bit is turned off, is zero, then no interrupts at all will occur. The peripheral interrupt enable bit controls all the interrupts except for the interrupt on change 
and the timer zero interrupt. But all and and the interrupt. So there's three things it doesn't control. The single pin that's designated as an interrupt, which was the legacy pin. It was the only peripheral pin that would cause interrupts in the older chips. And then we added the interrupt on change function. Uh, and that's enabled by the interrupt on change interrupt uh, enable pin bit. And then timer zero. So those three things, timer zero, interrupt on change, and the, uh, and the uh, interrupt pin. Now, the bit that enables the interrupt pin is this one, the I-N-T-E. That's, that's, that's what turns on that single pin. So those are the three things, timer zero enable, the interrupt pin enable for the single pin, and the interrupt change enable uh, bit for uh, there are two registers involved with that, all a port B and all a port A. But port C does not have any interrupt on change. All right, so if we go down to the interrupt on change, um, which we're, we're not using this time, so I don't want you to get too confused here. Uh, it's right here in chapter 13, interrupt on change. And what you can see is that uh, the port A pins can be configured to operate as interrupt on change, and the port... Uh, B pins can be also configured to operate as interrupt on change pins. And the, uh, the interrupt on change, so you have to turn on the interrupt and change master enable bit. You have to configure the pin, and then you have to decide whether you're gonna do rising and or falling edge detection. And then you have to turn on the each pin's interrupt enable uh, 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 bit and and then you have to go read the uh, the interrupt enable flags or the interrupt flags so okay so uh, if we go look at this there's some registers involved so this is the uh, the interrupt on change a port po positive edge so IOC a positive edge so you can set up for the rising edge to trigger an interrupt on RA5 RA4, RA3, even the master clear pin, RA2, RA1, and RA0. But of course, RA0, RA1, and RA3 are being used for our pick kit, uh, sorry, our, our snap uh, programmer debugger. So they're really not available to us per se. Uh, but, and then five and two are used for the LED. So the only one that would really be reasonable to use is four. And actually, believe it or not, I think that pin four is also the interrupt pin. I always, I never can remember that. And I, I have to go back to the top of the thing and uh, and and look at the, the, the sheet that lays out all the pins right here. And you'll see there's one pin that's int. Okay, nope, it's, it's I8, it's, uh, it's RA2, not four, I was wrong. So it is RA2. So, the, so in the legacy devices, RA2, uh, was the only pin that could cause an interrupt. Now we have a whole bunch of other pins. Now why would you want to use a peripheral pin for an interrupt? Well, one example of that, um, the uh, let's say you interface a per, uh, an external uh, accelerometer. And your uh, external accelerometer uh, has... Um, I'm going to blow this up. So your external accelerometer... Uh, has the ability to detect falling. Now, normally you read the, the this, many of the, the, the uh, there's some that don't work this way, but most of them are read by the I squared C interface. So if you wanna, if you wanna read uh, what your acceleration is on the X, Y, and Z axis, then you do it by using uh, the I squared C interface. But let's say you wanted to, uh, let's say you were, um, I don't know, you were, you were, you were going to protect. You were you're going to do something to protect, say, a uh, a disk drive, a portable disk drive, and if it got dropped, you wanted to lock the heads so the heads wouldn't. Uh, you wanted to pull them out of the platters so the heads wouldn't bounce into the disk and scratch any of the platters, and so so what you do the most uh, accelerometers have a, a special pin that outputs a uh, a signal if uh, if it detects that uh, the z-axis suddenly goes to zero, or if all the axes suddenly go to zero. And that's what happens if you drop something. So normally if something's sitting on a the desk, then 
some of the some of the the z axis that goes through the middle of the disk will register 1 g the, the force of gravity because that's what's pushing the the accelerometer onto the de to the desk but if you drop it suddenly that that axis goes to zero uh, and so do the other axes they might show a little bit but many of the accelerometers are built to detect this event and when they do it they send a signal on a special line if you connected that line to your interrupt pin in this case RA2 or if you wanted to use one of the interrupt on change pins which would be any of the port A pins and any of the port B pins that you can use then you could interrupt the processor on that on that on that event and you could uh, and the processor would go oh uh, we got an interrupt and then it would immediately find that uh, the interrupt came from the accelerometer if it checked because uh, it knows what pin it's coming in on and maybe it's even the only interrupt and so then it would send a signal out to say a portable disk drive to uh, park its heads and so you might have that might that might take maybe four or five instructions um, so maybe uh, five five microseconds at the clock rate we were using even even uh, a quarter of that if we were using the maximum clock speed and then the the disk would have time to park its heads before it hits the floor and uh, so that's that's one use uh, pretty cool use there's other many other things that that, that could be useful um, it could be an emergency stop switch who knows a lot of different things could be set up with that interrupt um, and so it's a it's a really nice feature okay uh, so I'm kind of droning on here a little bit all right so again it's uh, you can definitely re you should definitely read on the data sheet about interrupts and that's chapter 8 the interrupt chapter does not cover chapter 13 interrupt on change that's just a, that's a that just covers this th that specific cause of interrupts and interrupts that are caused by some of the peripheral modules like the a to d converter and the uh, pwm and the accelerometers all those things are not accelerometers but uh, i don't know all the almost most of the modules can generate interrupts and again you might have an external device that would also generate an interrupt so that's that's how that works okay let's see all right let's go through the data sheet then so we'll bring this back up or not the data sheet but um, the lab sheet so so the next thing we're going to do um, so this is a good description of interrupts and you'll see that one of the things we do we clear the 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 uh, in the interrupt control register we clear the timer zero interrupt flag and then that's because we don't want to cause an interrupt when we set up all our interrupts now um, one of the things that's going to happen is in our interrupt routine we're going to want to uh, if the LED if, R, if RA5 is high we're going to want to set it low and the next time we come into the interrupt routine if it's low we want to set it high now we could read that pin and then and then decide what and then use an if statement and, and set it high or low depending on how it reads but it's easier just to toggle it unfortunately we don't have a we don't have a uh, uh, a bit toggle F like we have a bit set F and bit clear F we do have a bit set F and bit clear F but no bit toggle F so the only the only way we can toggle it is to use an exclusive or but we have to use the byte oriented exclusive or instruction which means we don't want to toggle we don't want to toggle all the bits um, so what we want to do is we want to put a one in a mask that we load up into W to the W register and then we want to exclusive or W with RA5 or sorry uh, actually with the uh, with the lat with with the, the LATA register so that we toggle the the pin 5 flip-flop uh, and what what that's going to do then is each time we enter the ISR it's going to change the state of RA5 it's going to make it high then it'll be low then high then low and because we're entering the ISR every time timer 0 rolls over we're going to be we're going to see the blink because obviously the delay is going to be generated by timer 0 because it's going to have to count all the way up 
256 with a prescaler of 256 in order to uh, overflow and execute the ISR. And each time we go in the ISR, we have to do two things. We have to toggle uh, LAT, uh, we, we, uh, LATA, latch A, and we have to make sure we clear the timer zero interrupt flag. If we don't clear the timer zero interrupt flag, then as soon as we return from the interrupt, we'll turn on the GIE bit again, and it'll say, hey, there's, there's another interrupt already. So it'll go right back into the ISR. It will never execute the mainline code. So, uh, so, so that's why that's why we have to clear that interrupt flag. Okay, and that's pretty much true for most interrupts for most microprocessors. You you have to manually clear the flags. Okay, uh, we show you a little example of how to create a mask here. We use pound to find and then the keyword mask. Mask is just a word. Wherever it sees the word mask, it's going to put in parenthesis one shifted two times to the left like that. That would be perfect if we wanted to affect RA2. If we want to affect RA5, we need a, another, a different mask like this. And I, I gave you a little hint up here. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> and of course, we will have to, uh, when we do latch, latch A, we're going to have to bank sell it, obviously. Okay, so then we load the match into W, and then we exclusive or W with F, latch A, comma F, after we bank sell, and that toggles RA5. Uh, and then after that, uh, we're pretty much done. That We just do the return from interrupt enable, which means that we're going to go back, restore all the shadow registers, rest restore the program counter to the next instruction, and turn back on the global interrupt enable bit. So we can be re-interrupted. And again, there's no, no delay in the ISR. We don't need one. And um, we're going to put the code at, at hex 0004 in our program memory because uh, that's the interrupt vector. That's where control will be transferred whenever we generate an interrupt. And we'll use the org directive to do that. Okay, I, you could also use a different directives, but that's the easiest one, I think, to use. Okay, and then this goes through some of the steps to get everything set up. So we first clear the timer zero flag. Then we set incom comma seven. And if you remember uh, the incom register, that's the GIE bit. So that turns on interrupts, all the interrupts, well, that turns on interrupts. So any interrupt that's been enabled uh, can generate an interrupt. Hopefully the only thing that's been enabled will be the timer zero interrupt. But we also have to do that with this next instruction, bit set F interrupt control register bit five. Set the timer zero interrupt enable bit in the incon register. So this is the bit that that allows timer zero to interrupt. So that 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 basically enables it to interrupt, but that's not the interrupt flag. It's the interrupt flag that actually causes the interrupt. If this bit is a zero, the interrupt flag will still be set when the timer overflows, but it won't cause an interrupt. If the GIE bit is cleared, the timer zero interrupt flag will still be set when the timer overflows, but it won't cause an interrupt. Uh, but if they're both set when the timer zero overflows and sets that flag, it will cause an interrupt. And you have to clear it, otherwise it'll keep causing interrupt after interrupt. All right, um, so the challenge is for you to write the rest of the ISR. Here's the part of the ISR it's already written. So ARG4, that's going to start you at location 4. And uh, that means this first instruction will be at location 4, so that will get executed. And what it does, it's a bank select for the INTCON register. And it's okay to change the, B to change the BSR because when you return to the mainline routine, the shadow registers will... Uh, will automatically uh, restore the BSR to whatever it was at before it jumped. And you, you don't know where, you, you have no idea where you jumped from. Uh, so you, it, the processor handles all that stuff automatically, which is really nice. It also restores the W register, so you don't have to do that. Um, if it didn't provide that hardware support, the first several instructions would be saving any registers you were going to use or mess with, like the BSR, the W register, uh, and so forth. And of course, it uh, it pushes the 
Uh, it doesn't have a shadow register for the uh, program counter. It pushes the program counter onto the stack. And that's because the program counter is a 15-bit register and the shadow registers are all 8-bit registers, I think. Uh, yeah. They do hold, they also, the shadow registers also do support the, uh, the indirect registers. But I think it does, it, I think it does the four, you know, the high and low bytes in separate registers. Anyway, um, so we're going to clear, we're going to, we're going to, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to test the interrupt flag, the timer zero interrupt flag. And, and it should be set. If it's not set, then there's a problem. So what we do, we do a bit test F skip set. So as long as it's set, it's going to skip the reset. If for some reason it's clear, we've got a problem because the timer zero flag didn't cause the interrupt. Something else did. So things are screwed up. So we're just going to reset the chip. Then we're going to do a bit clear F and uh, incon2, and that's going to clear this, this, uh, this flag, the timer zero interrupt flag. And then we're going to select latch A, bank cell latch A, and we're going to load up W with our mask, and then we're going to use the exclusive OR with latch A and leave the result in latch A because we, we have to put the, the one bit F after that. Remember, most of the byte instructions, most of the byte oriented instructions do have a second operand, which is a single bit, and you either you either uh, set a bit, uh, you either get, put a one in, or you can put an F, which means leave the result of the W and F operation in the F register, or you put a zero, which means leave it in the W register. In this case, our F, our file register, our F register is latch A. And so it'll leave the result in latch A, which means it will toggle pin 5. And that's great. That's what we want. And, and then we do, the, then we do uh, the return from interrupt enable instruction. And we're back in our mainline routine going on happily merrily until we get another overflow from timer 0. So hopefully that's a quick and dirty explanation of, uh, of how this can work. Okay. Uh, so I think I'm going to leave that there. Um, okay. So now what I think I'll do, uh, I think I'll talk a little bit more. Um, let me just go through the instructions one more time and then I'll, and then I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll work on a, a little code. So maybe I'll shrink this back down and I'll bring the, uh, the, uh, data sheet up. All right. So let's, let's now go all the way down to chapter 20, uh, Nine, I think it is the instruction set summary. Now, I, I just want to go through this again because this this will hopefully help you. Now you've written a couple of programs and you've gotten your feet wet with assembly language, and so you you should be some of this should really be making sense to you. Um, okay, so remember these are some of the key descriptions. Remember we have this this little D bit down here. That's the destination select bit. It is a single bit. D equals 0 stores the result in W, and D equals 1 stores the result in the register F, whatever you specified in the, in the instruction as the file register. It could be a memory location, it could be a special function register, whatever. And if you do not specify this, it defaults to D equals 1, which means it will leave the, re the result in the file register by default. Um, so if you want to load something to the W, you've got to put the W. You've got to put a zero. Otherwise, it, it's going to stay in the file register. And then we have some other things. Um, the, this K is our literal field in our literal instructions. And then we have this, uh, we have this little B address, which is we use that with the bit set F uh, and bit clear F instructions and the bit test F skips set, bit test F skips clear. You have a 3-bit B field that tells which bit uh, is going to be worked on. And then the, the F stands for the file register. And remember, the file register has puts 7 bits of its address into the instruction. You're responsible for making sure that the upper 5 bits are in the, the BSR by using a bank select instruction. Uh, not instruction, but a bank select assembler directive. Okay, so uh, 
So the, these again are the general formats. These byte-oriented instructions generally have an opcode, a single D-bit, and seven bits of file register address. And again, the other five bits, because you need 12 bits for an address in, in data memory, the other five bits are have to be in the BSR. Now, usually we're only dealing with the first 0, 1, 2, or 3 banks. We really rarely get past that in banks. Uh, maybe a few more, but that's about it. But sometimes we do. If you had lots of variables, you might get there. And then this is our, these are our, our bit-oriented operations. Bit set F, bit clear F, uh, bit test F, skip set, bit test F, skip clear. Again, seven bits for the file register, three bits for that B field, which tells which bit, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7. And that specifies the bit that's going to be affected. The other bit should be left alone. And then we have some other ones. Uh, this is the literal instructions uh, for W where we have an 8-bit literal field. Um, and this would be uh, move uh, literal to W, M-O-V-L-F, uh, I'm sorry, M-O-V-L-W, uh, and literal with W, so uh, A and D, L, W, and, and a bunch of those instructions. But we have a few others where we can, uh, one call, one, one M-O-V-L-P where we can affect the, uh, the uh, upper seven bits of the program counter, and the MOVLB instruction, which loads the, the lower five bits of the, uh, uh, of the BSR. So these two instructions are kind of weird. They only do th that one thing and nothing else. Um, and then we have the branch and the go-to instructions. That's the call, also call and go-to are in this format, the branch instructions. You can use the branch. You can use the go-to. Uh, there's no real difference except that the branch only has nine bits of literal, and the go-to has... Uh, 11 bits of literal. So when you make this into a two's complement offset, you can branch backwards and forwards uh, a greater distance with the uh, uh, go-to and also with the call. Um, but for short branches, the BRA is fine. It doesn't really matter. Uh, you can always use the go-to. Forget the, B the BRA. And, uh, and then these are the indirect operations. And then there's a few opcode onlys like no op, sleep, reset, things like that. All right, so again, here are the byte-oriented instructions. So remember, we have add W to F, add W to F with carry. Notice these all have that second single D bit to specify where to leave it, whether in the specified F register, like port B, port A, port C, uh, location, you know, your X variable, location 35, whatever, or leave it in W. Zero leaves it in, in the W register, and a one leaves it wherever the file register is referenced. You then have a clear F instruction with no, uh, no choice about where to leave the result. You have a clear W with no, second op no operand at all. Uh, you have a uh, complement F instruction, decrement F instruction, increment F instruction, increment uh, inclusive OR, W with F. So you take whatever's in W and you or it bit by bit with whatever's in F and then you leave that result based on that single D bit, either in W or with the F you used. Move F. This loads the contents of F into W if you specify a 0 for D. If you specify a 1 for D, it doesn't really do anything except it'll set the Z bit if F has nothing in it, if it's 0. Move W to F. No second operand here because it always takes whatever's in W, dumps it into F. Whatever was in F is now being overwritten by what was in W. What was in W is still in W. It hasn't gone away. Uh, but it's now been replicated in F. And then we have rotate right through carry, rotate left through carry, or ro rotate left, rotate right through carry. And then we have subtract, and then subtract with a borrow. That means from the carry bit, basically. And then we have swap nibbles. So the lower four bits take the place of the upper four bits, and the upper four bits take the place of the lower four bits. Um, and then we have the exclusive or uh, W with F. And this is the instruction we're going to use in our ISR to toggle the bit. Uh, triggered all these things, but that's what we're going to use, right? Oh, well, whatever. We're going to use this. And this does take a second destination bit, 
So you do want to affect, you want to leave the result not in W, but in the file register. So what will be in W? W will need to be, will have the mask. And the mask will need to have a one in the location you want to affect, uh, the, the bit location. So the bit you want to affect, you have to put a one in that location. And that's why we, it's nice to use a mask. All right, and then we also have these two other byte-oriented skip operations, decrement f skip on zero, increment f skip on zero. Then we have our four bit-oriented file register operations where you can affect just a single bit or you can test just a single bit in a file register. Here you, you can change the bits, set or clear. Here you just test the bit, you don't change anything, but you skip the next instruction or not, depending on what the, what the bit test shows. In this case, if the bit is clear, you skip, means the bit's a zero. Here, if the bit is a one, you skip. And so you have to kind of think and not get confused about whether you want to skip or, or whether you want to skip on clear or skip on set. And usually you try it and when it doesn't work, oops, I got the wrong one, so you switch it. All right, and then we have the literal operations here. Most of them use, uh, will operate on a literal and W. The one we've used the most is you load the literal into W. You move literal to W. But you can also just and it to W. You can add it to W. You can inclusive or it or or it with W. You can exclusive or it with W. You can subtract it from W. In these cases, there's no other place to leave the result except for the W register because this actual literal is embedded in the instruction. And you can see here's, here would be a typical instruction. And the Ks represent the actual data, the literal that's going to be uh, used. Okay, I think that's everything. Um, so that, that should, you know, so we've reviewed these instructions. And then we do have a few, you know, this is kind of the cats and dogs here. Uh, the branch instructions, the go-to, the return from interrupt, the return from the subroutine. Um, clear the watchdog timer, no operation. Don't worry about option and tris. Those are just left over. Reset and sleep, though, we'll use. And then there's the, uh, uh, then, then there's these C compiler optimized instructions we're not going to really get into. Uh, the, you could use them, though. Uh, I mean, that's certainly legal. Okay. All right. I think I'm going to move this down. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to expand this to big here again. And I'm going to change cameras. And I'm going to try and work through, um, oh, my thing went off or something. Anyway, but here it is. Okay. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is turn on uh, my surface here and look at the surface with the uh, with the uh, so we try and get everything lined up. I don't want it. Okay, so maybe we need to go just a little bit higher. Oops. What the heck? Okay, oops, I'll do this. Okay, so, so here we go. Let's see, I think, let me make sure, I do want to make sure we get all this in. Okay, that's good. Okay, and it goes down to... Down to about, okay, right, right about there. Okay, got it. So we should be all right. All right, now, what do we do? Let's say we want to, uh, let's say we want to look at some code. Now, um, so a couple of things. Let's look at masks first. So, so there's, there's, so masks and setting and clearing. bits. Now the nice thing about masks is that you can set and clear one in a say if you're dealing with bytes you can set clear one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight. You can affect all the bits or just one or two of them or just none of them or whatever. The other thing that's nice about masks is that this actually works really well when you get a uh, larger word size. So eight bits, eight bits isn't too bad. Uh, let's say you have, we'll draw a little, we'll draw a little register here, okay? Uh, 
Okay, let's say you want to set bit um, 7, 3, 1, and 0. Okay, you want to set 7, 3, 1, and 0. Now, how would you, do, how would you go about doing that? Well, uh, you could do it a couple different ways. The easy, so one way would be able to do a mask. All right. Uh, so let's 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 let well, let's first show. So this is bit seven, and this is bit zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we want to have a we want to have a, a one here. We want to have a one here. We want to have a one here, and a one there. So and the rest we we want to leave the rest un, unchanged. We don't want to mess with them. We want them to leave them alone. You want them, um, um, yeah, n uh, nolo moleste. We want to leave them unmolested, okay? So the way we do this then is, is we can, we can or a mask and the mask needs to look like this. We want a one in the mask in bit seven. We want a one in the mask in bit three. We want a one in bit one and a one in bit zero. And we want zeros. Golly, how come? I don't know why. It, I, I'm still learning how to use this stupid thing. All right, we want zeros everywhere else. So one's where we want to take a, an action of setting the bit, and zeros where we want to leave it alone, and then. So we could do this a couple of ways. We can look at this, especially with an 8-bit byte. We could say, well, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4. So we can draw a line here. This is 8, and this is 1, 0, 0, uh, 1, 0, 1, 1. That is going to be uh, D, right? No, sorry, B. Yeah, that's B. So, our, so we can say our mask then, mask, we can say uh, pound define mask, and then we can say 0x8b. So that'll make mask equal to 8b. We can also say mask equ 0x8b. That'll work too. And there's a bunch of other ways we can do it. Um, it's also so that's fine, and for eight bits, it's not too bad. I can I can write uh, I can write those things in. Oops, I didn't get this done. God bless. Okay, there we go. Okay, eight B. So, but now, but there's a much better way to do this. Okay. A, a much better way to do this is to uh, it, it is to use is is to use this nomenclature where we where we write things a little differently where we write it like this where we would say instead of ma instead of this we would say uh, we would say one shifted seven times ORed with one shifted three times ORed with one shifted once or with one okay so that would give us exactly the same thing it would give us a pattern of one zero 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 one zero one one now what if we want to what if we want to it what if we want to clear some bits ah well, now that's a little different. Now we would use that same, let's say we wanted to clear bits 7, 3, 1, and 0. And we wanted to leave all the other bits unchanged. How would we do that? In this case, we would create the mask exactly like we just did. We would have, we would do, we would set it up as uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, Zero one one, and we could call that zero x eight b. 
or we could use you know one shifted uh, seven uh, or with one shifted three or with one shifted one or with one all right that'll be fine all right and you can write one shifted zero that's also fine it's maybe better to do one shifted zero because it it's it follows the same format of the others and it is always a little confusing because when you have a one in the lowest bit position it's in the bit zero position and it's easy to get the bit one position and the bit zero positions mixed up so just try and keep that straight so these sometimes these can be confusing a little bit all right so we would use the same mask but now look what we do we would put parentheses around it and we would do a little tilde which means we would give it a bitwise inversion a bitwise inversion and and uh, so that's really interesting right so our bitwise inversion would flip everything in here and now we would have zero one 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 zero one zero zero this doesn't look like a zero so now you, that's what your mask would be and and it would be the same thing if you put if you put the if you put the tilde in front of this mess here I forgot this parenthesis but you have parentheses around the whole thing and then you use the tilde the tilde should look like this and you in, and you bitwise invert your entire mask now you have zeros now you have zeros where you want to whether you want the action to take place now how do you make that work well so let's say we so this is our mask and it equals the word mask so then you would you could do the instruction you could do and w with f mask i'm sorry got ahead of myself here before we can do this we have to do the first step well let's say we're going to use uh let's say x is uh let's say we define x somewhere uh as location 30 say okay so the first thing you do is you bank cell x and then you would load up your mask m o v literal to w mask so now the mask is sitting in w w looks just like this 0 1 1 1 0 1 0 0 and now you would and w with f x and you would leave it in f so you override x with the with the new change now where there's a z so let's say for sake of argument the ex the current value of x just happened to be we'll say x currently uh, let's say x equals um, uh, one zero one one zero one zero one one two three four one two three four all right what's gonna what is it gonna equal at the end of this little uh, program segment so we're going to and it we're going to bitwise and it with the mask which is um, 0 1 1 1 0 1 0 0 remember we we inverted the mask bitwise so so let's see so 0 and with 1 would be 0 1 and with 0 would be 0 1 and with 1 would be 1 one ended with one would be one zero with uh zero would be uh zero one with one would be one zero with zero would be zero and one with zero would be zero okay uh somewhere i messed up because i don't have enough bits one two three four okay so it's so let's let's do this zero one 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 so zero one 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 and then the next group zero one zero zero so so now this is what's in x and notice our mask was going to affect was going to clear bit seven three one and zero so bit seven, yes, it's cleared. Bit three, 
yes it's cleared and one and zero and it and it left the other bits which were one one here and a one here zero here and a zero there totally unchanged well sorry where's the three uh, uh, zero one two yeah well the three was a zero anyway uh, yeah so it leaves it leaves everything else unchanged and it made sure that bit seven is zero bit three was already a zero so that's fine bit zero and one or one and zero were also zeroed out one was already a zero but but zero was a one uh, sorry uh, which one this is this is actually yeah this is our mask I'm getting confused and this is this was our X value so bit 7 was a 1 now it's clear bit 6 is unchanged still a 0 what What? The, uh, how did I kill my app? No, I guess I guess it's gone. Oh, maybe not. Oh, yeah, it's good. Okay. All right. So, so I, I hopefully, hopefully you have the idea that it does exactly what we wanted it to do. It, it takes, it takes the mask and it when you add this mask, wherever you had an, a a one before you inverted the mask, it's going to clear it. You inverted the mask. Now there's a zero there, and there are ones everywhere else. And it's going to, where there are 1s, unchanged. And where there are 0s, you're going to clear. So you guarantee that bit 7, 3, 1, and 0 will be zeros, And whatever was in 1, uh, in 6, 5, 4, and 2 will be unchanged. So 6 was a 0. 5 and 4 were 1s. Yep, yep. Uh, then 3, it's 0. 2 was a 1. Yep, it's unchanged. So the, so the, the 4, uh, the, three bits the four bits you didn't want to change weren't changed and the th four bits you wanted to change were changed so that's that's how this works now what if we wanted to toggle the bits aha so now let's let's talk about that what if you wanted to toggle the bits all right toggle so we're going to toggle the bits now for toggling the bits we go back to, we do just like we did with the inclusive OR, with ORing the bits to set them, only we exclusive OR the same mask. So let's say we want to affect bits 7, 3, 1, and 0. So we create the same mask we did before, which in binary is going to, is going to have a 1 in those positions and 0 everywhere else. So 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. That's our mask. We don't invert it or anything like that. And of course we can set that up a couple different ways. We can write its its hex value, which in this case would be 8B 0, 0x8B. Or we can we can do it we can do it with uh, with with our uh, We can do it with uh, with our little uh, uh, nomenclature, which would be uh, we would do parenthesis one shifted seven, just like we did before, ORed with one shifted three, ORed with one shifted one, ORed with one shifted zero. And then, we're, in this case, we're not going to invert the whole thing, but maybe I'll put parentheses around the whole thing just to illustrate that. If we did need to clear bits, we'd put the tilde out here, and then 
that would flip all these bits, but we don't we don't want that in this case, so we're getting rid of that. And then we use this mask and we do the same thing we just did, only we bank cell. Say we're going to do uh, latch C, L A T C, and then we're going to uh, load up the mask. So we move literal to W, and um, that literal then uh, is, we'll call it mask, or we'll just say 0x8b, or you could even do 0b100001001. That would work too. And then you do x uh, or w with f, l a t c comma f. Remember, you need that one, that extra one bit there. Most of the most of the byte oriented instructions require that, but uh, but the most frequently used uh, byte oriented instructions, the the move literal to w and move w to f, are the, are two of the ones that don't require it. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. But all the others, exclusive or inclusive or and, they all do it. So now we've looked at We've looked at how we can set a bit, how we can clear a bit, and how we can toggle a bit, or bits, bit or bits in a word. Now what's really nice about this is that we, we, can, uh, we can do this in an 8-bit word, it's, it's not too unwieldy to, uh, to, to sit down uh, just like I did, you know, draw out a little uh, sort of example register, you know, count out all the bits and everything, and then sort of figure it all out, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then put the 1 in, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and then figure, okay, that's going to be, that's going to be 8, that's going to be B. Okay, you can do that. That's not impossible. But how about if you have 32 bits? What about then? I mean, just getting the dang thing divided up is enough to kill you. I think I've already missed one. I lost track somewhere here. I don't even think I have 32 bits now. I think I missed a couple. And then you're going to go through and you're going to try and figure out, you know, let's say you want to do bit 27, 19, uh, 15, 10, uh, 3, and 0. Good luck. And then you want to get, how many hex digits is it? Well, in a 32-bit word, you have 8 hex digits. So, eight hex digits. That's going to be very challenging to get all of those right and not make a mistake. So let's say let's say you let's let's make it a little easier. Let's say you only want to do say 27, 19, um, 15, and say z zero. Well, now you can do that. You would just say um, you would just say uh, pound define um, mask. We'll call it mask A, and then you would go um, one shifted twenty seven, or with one shifted nineteen, or with one shifted fifteen, or with uh, one shifted zero. And now you can look at this, and you can pretty well see you're interested in bit twenty seven. 19, 15, and 0. You immediately know what's going on in this, in this defined. Whereas if you came up with the, the, the hex equivalent of that in 8 digits, you know, I, I don't even know. I, it's such a pain to do this, I don't want to even bother. But, you know, something like uh, 0, uh, x, um, so let's see, so uh, 
so it starts at 31, 31, so 31, 30, 29, 28. So there's a 1 there at 27. So that's going to be 0, 1, and then 0, 0, and then I don't know where 19, that might be a 2, 0, 0, 0, 15 might be, um, might be, uh, might be 4, uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, or something like that. And how many do we have? 1, 2, well, we've got too many. Uh, we only we only need eight digits. So, yeah, whatever. But uh, it's it's a real pain. It's very difficult to do and not make a mistake. This is very clear and easy to do, and you're not likely to make a mistake. So, uh, and this can be defined way up at the beginning of your program, and then when you get ready to use the mask, you can you can just uh, write in mask A. Especially if you're going to do it a bunch of times, you might be able to do that. All right. So that is how that is how we set, clear, and toggle bits. We use we use the R for set. We use the AND for clear, and we use the XR for toggling with a mask. Our mask has to be inverted. mask here but here we just use mask and mask and to invert the mask we we just put a tilde in front of it and that inverts it all right so so that's that's how we deal with with uh with with masks let me just let me just review some of the other things now we've done these already so i want you to make sure and you can go back and look at the videos in the notes but remember, make sure you know one how to. Uh, let's see. I'm trying uh, how to do the 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 assembly language for loop. Of course, you can't use the word for, so you have to use decrement f skip on zero instruction. You have to set it up with an index. You have to initialize the index. And then you have to have a, a branch instruction that gets skipped on 0. Make sure you put in the, the decimal value for the number of times you want to do the loop. Um, and if you put in a hex value, make sure that hex value is, is equivalent to the decimal value you're interested in. So if you put in 0x10, that's 16 times, not 10. Keep that in mind. But if you just write 10, then that will be considered base 10, whereas 0x will be considered base 16. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so we've so so first we've we learned how to do the loop. All right. Now, secondly, we learned uh, we learned how to exchange variables. Yeah, maybe just one R. I don't know variables like X and Y using a third register Z as a scratch pad register. So you know how to exchange variables, so that's good. All right, and uh, I guess this is good. That's pretty good. Uh, so then we also learn how to configure a register. And we, uh, the one we looked at was OSCON, but we've looked at some other ones, and uh, we'll probably I'll work some more. Uh, I'll work some more next week, so that, so that you're comfortable with this. Then we learned how to set up a GPIO port for input and for output. Now, 
in both cases, we should, we should, we must deal with the TRIS register, the TRIS X register, A, B, C, or D, and the analog select and cell X register, A, B, C, or D. In the cell register, we want to make the bits digital so we clear. And in the TRIS register, the input in is a 1 and out we have to we have to make it a zero. So so we have to keep all that in mind. And then and then finally we learned how learned how to poll on a bit. You can also poll on a value or some other things, but in this case we polled on a bit. And what we did um, is we uh, let we used the push button hooked up to RB7. So so uh, and we tested it. So we first first you have to if you're going to do this, then you have to set up the input correctly by making the tris register a one in this case in bit seven. So tris b uh, tris B bit 7 has to be a 1. You can do that by writing a byte in there where a 1's in the, the, seven, the bit 7 position or you can use the bit set F tris comma 7 instruction. Of course you have to bank cell tris first. Uh, so, so that set up the tris and then we we also knew that uh, just for good programming practice we should we should always uh, make sure that the Ansel register, uh, the Ansel B, has bit seven cleared. Now it turns out there is no Ansel bit seven uh, for port B, <coughs> so that's fine. You wouldn't really have to do that, but it's just good programming practice because if you ever set up an input on another pin that does have an Ansel bit and you forget to do it, it simply will not work. You will read all you you will not read what's coming in on that pin. Unless it's an accident, yeah, I, you, I forget what it does. It usually reads one, I think, but but it won't change or switch. It's it and it could even vary depending on factors. So so you must clear. You really need to clear that bit. Okay, and uh, and so once we do that, we learned how to tie to create a little tight loop that just continues to to check that bit. And and let's say we let's say we're going to do bit seven. So the first thing we'll do is we'll bank cell the port B. Now we also learned when we want to input stuff, we have to do the port command. When we want to write stuff to a pin, we want to use the latch command, the latch, the latch register. Port register for reads, latch register for writes. Even though you can write to the, to the port, you shouldn't. You should only write to the latch. So we're going to bank cell port B. And then we're going to have a little loop here. We'll call it loop loop three for no reason. And then in loop we're going to do bit test f skip. Uh, so we so which do you want to do? Do you want to wait here as long as the button's being held down? Let's do that. So so stay stay till button released. Okay, so if that's the case, then we want to skip set because if the button's being pushed, it's going to read clear. So we'll branch uh, bit test F skip set port B comma 7. That's the three bit uh, bit field that specifies which bit we're going to test. Bit test F skip clear. And I'm yeah, I think it's just BTF. Let me make sure it's not. I don't think it is bit. But this, I'm just going to make sure. Let's just check this really quick. It is, I think. Yeah, BTF. Okay, fine. Okay, and uh, so so and then we have to put the branch. I'll just use the BRA because it's shorter than go to loop three. So this is going to take us right back up there, and we're just going to stay in this tight little loop, going round and round and round, 
until uh, and if, if somebody's fingers on the button then the buttons gonna read clear and so it's not gonna skip it's gonna take the branch but as soon as the fingers off the button then the buttons gonna test set and it's going to skip this instruction and just go on in the code on down to whatever the next instructions we have down here are and it won't ever come up there again unless we somewhere else issue a branch and come back around and do this again now obviously what would happen if you encountered this loop and the and the person did not have their finger on the button well then then what would happen is it would just drop right through it would never branch even the first time because uh, it would be set because no button was being pushed and it would jump over this instruction and keep going what if you wanted to write it so that it would run down to this point and stop and then wait for the button to be pushed regardless of whether the button was being pushed now or not well you could do that a couple ways one way you could do it is you could bit test f skip clear and then it runs down through here it's going to it's going to read the button as high so it won't skip so it'll just take this branch and stay in this loop and then when you finally push the button it'll drop through so that's that's certainly one good way to do it um, sometimes we want to first wait until the buttons uh, well we want to wait while the buttons not pushed and then we want to wait we want to drop through and wait till the button is then released when it finally is pushed and that's how that's what we would do if we wanted to sort of time how long the button would be held down and then what we might do is put a little counter in our loop with a little delay and we could actually we could actually time uh, within reason uh, in our case we only have uh, you know we can only count up to 255 and that rolls over so uh, so we'd probably want to do this in C where we'd have at least 16 uh, you know uh, 16 uh, bit uh, integers uh, and we just do a 16 bit unsigned integer and, and let it count up to 65,000 uh, and if we had a little delay in there maybe of a uh, a tenth of a second then you could count up to 65,000 tenths of a second so that would work pretty well um, so um, so anyway so so that's how you could actually time how long the buttons held down and the reason that might be useful is sometimes we'll generate different actions by whether there's a long button push or a short button push and you can set that up using the same sort of techniques um, you could zero the count before you come into this loop and then when the buttons uh, you could wait till the buttons pushed then you could drop through and and wait while it is pushed after you zeroed the count at the beginning and then you could continue to increment the count with a slight delay of maybe a tenth of a second and so when the button was finally released you'd have a count that indicated how many tenths of a second uh, the button was held down and you could say if it was held down for uh, two seconds or less then you do one thing and if it's more than that you do something else um, and all you would have to do is check and see if your count is uh, is under is uh, 20 or less or 19 you know 19 or less um, so there are, there are a lot of really powerful ways you can use this um, okay let's see um, I think we're stopped with this um, and uh, so we'll continue to work. We'll continue to, to, to work on this code in lab on Friday or at home, and uh, come to lab if you need help. We'll be there till three. Um, I'll be there probably at, uh, for a couple of hours in the morning, but then I, I probably won't stay too long in the afternoon. Um, and then um, because I've I've got a test that students are going to do in logic design, um, which I haven't written yet, so I've got to get that done. Um, okay, so I think with that we will quit. Um, so let me just do this. We'll switch this back. Okay, uh, like I said, I will try and do a help session on Friday at uh, at five. Uh, so sorry, four four o'clock on Friday. So let me write that down so I don't forget.
Okay, uh, so USD number 10. I'll do that. Hmm. I'll make the design number 10. And then micro. micro one, number 8. Okay, got it. All right. We will see you. Um, so we'll see you all, hopefully, some of you in lab on Friday.